Okay, great. Um, and so to get us started, I'm going to turn us over to Beatrix, who will introduce our very special guest. All right. Thanks Adam. a lot, Lisa. So I'm Beatrix Hutton. I am a master's student in the Mighty program. Very excited to be the co-host with Lisa. So I just want to quickly introduce uh, Mr. Bowley. Uh, so Mr. Powley is a 13-year teaching veteran and currently the dual enrollment American history teacher at HCS Early College High School. Since 2012, he has transformed his classroom based on the principles of game-inspired design and has been honored to receive several accolades, including the South Carolina Council on the Social Studies Teacher of the Year Award in 2015, HCS Tech Innovator, and South Carolina DAR Teacher of the Year. He is an advocate of game-inspired design and has been honored to serve as the Hori, I sorry if I mess it up, County School Social Studies Blended Learning Model in Zemplar, present at FT, FETC 2017 SCCSS Annual Conferences, and is scheduled to present at the South Carolina EdTech 2017. Mr. Pally is also active in several Twitter PLN chats and hosts XPLAP Camp, a slow chat style gamification community. So please check that out if you're interested. So with that, I'll hand it off to Mr. Powley. We're so happy you're here. Well, thank you so much for having me. And um, hearing that all listed out is kind of embarrassing. Um, but I, I see a lot of names that uh, are participants in some of the chats I participate in. So uh, it's very exciting to uh, be able to talk directly to them, and I'm, I'm looking forward to answering some of the questions uh, that they might have. Um, the, uh, the the challenge of uh, offering a webinar um, is that we only have about 30 minutes or so, and uh, like I've, I've noticed with many of the people I talk with, um, that is not a whole lot of time to talk about all the intricacies and details of what goes into a, a game-inspired classroom. So. Um, I tried to break out uh, three, maybe four pieces of my classroom that uh, I'm really excited about talking about, and uh, hopefully we can talk about it, have some questions, and um, see where it goes from there. The first thing that I wanted to mention uh, is uh, my use of narrative. Um, I think that in most video games that I play, most games in general that I play, one of the, the big things that I like to uh, get into is is the narrative, and and we'll talk a little bit about player types in in a bit, um, and how narrative is a, a great way to both get students into a game, uh, as well as a motivation and and uh, providing a sense of of purpose later. Um, the the first element of the power of narrative, at least for me, is the idea that providing a storyline for students uh, can first of all give you a, a common language and a common aesthetic to build your class around. It also allows for immersion and exploration. Uh, my class, I treat sort of as a, uh, a role-playing game. So when I want students to immerse into the game, I'm really hoping that they dig into the characters, that they dig into their own avatar, uh, that they explore the world that I'm trying to build and that they can try to help build with me. The most important thing that at least I think that the narrative serves is answering that eternal question that students have. Why do I need to learn this? Um, it, a narrative can provide a sense of purpose. Uh, my narrative is the history underground, and we've talked about narrative before in some of our Twitter chats. Um, narrative um, provides that sense of purpose and goals. Uh, and if you're thinking about adding a narrative to your class, I would suggest that you start by thinking about what is the purpose of the class? In my classroom, I teach American history to 11th graders, and I want to teach them the content skills. We have a test on that and, and all that, but um, I want to teach content skills and the skills of a historian. And I want them to have the skills of a historian so they can be a better informed citizen. And I believe that that means that they need to evaluate sources, analyze arguments, uh, actively engage with important issues of the day. And I also want them to develop a, a, a BS detector, something where they can look at a source and find out uh, on their own if it's legitimate or not. Um, I'm inspired in this by uh, both the history standards, my love of history, and a lot of the Facebook posts that I uh, get in my feed. So I start with that sense of purpose in my mission to create the narrative. And in this history underground narrative, uh, the students are taking the role of a collector in this 
dystopian post-apocalyptic future where uh, there's a dictatorship that has banned history education. Uh, and our job is to go out and collect um, old recordings and to create public history uh, projects that uh, use that narrative uh, and use history skills in order to uh, accomplish those goals of becoming good informed citizens. Uh, I do think that um, the hero's journey is an important part of thinking about how to uh, build a narrative. The, uh, like I said, I, I treat mine like a, a role-playing game. Uh, the hero's journey is when a, uh, the, the player starts uh, as, as a weak, inexperienced, uh, normal person. Uh, they're given some sort of a task, usually by a, uh, some sort of a, a, a mythical figure. And then they go on this journey, gaining power, gaining skills. Eventually, they have a big boss battle. Uh, and then they reflect and move on to the next mission. Th th this is exactly how uh, I build most of my units. Uh, and it's how I start off the, the semester when we uh, start the, the project, uh, start the class. Uh, the students are walking down the street in my, uh, my flip classroom narrative. Uh, they're walking down the street and I whisper to them uh, that they need to get off the streets because they're being hunted. Uh, and hopefully at that point they're hooked and they're given a special mission, and then they become what I call the collector, uh, their collector 10, and uh, there's a whole storyline built about them uh, becoming this collector. So the hero's journey mirrors the, the unit structure. Oh, the boss battle is uh, our big common assessment, as well as any other assessments. Like right now, we're working on National History Day. It all ties into the storyline, uh, and it's promoting that real world sense of purpose along with the, the narrative sense of purpose. Um, I've heard in a few different places that uh, we that the school is a game. It's just a really bad design uh, game. So hopefully we're going to make a, a better design game. I think that treating the classroom like a, a role playing game helps to make it better uh, because if we think of our students in the sense of characters in a game, and I'm going to talk about avatars in a little bit, uh, the students are starting off like a, a weak avatar at the beginning of a, a role-playing game. Uh, when they come into the classroom, they've demonstrated no skills or no abilities. It doesn't mean that they don't have them. It just means that they haven't demonstrated it to me yet. So as they go through the class, they perform tasks, they demonstrate skills, they demonstrate that they know content. And while they do that, they're earning experience points. This is a, a pretty common trope in most uh, role-playing games that uh, as you progress through the game, you gain experience points. And as you gain experience points, you level up into new levels. I'm an advocate of uh, XP grading. I know that it's a bit of a controversial topic in the gamification world, um, but I like using XP as a, a grade. And I have a side economy based on gold in that. Uh, because I think that using XP to show a grade uh, is a really nice way to demonstrate uh, progress and demonstrate uh, growth within uh, the grade itself. Um, I have certain XP benchmarks that as they're met, the players level up, uh, their avatars earn new powers, they can access new weapons and new power cards. Uh, more importantly, I think that uh, the traditional grading scales are uh, not incredibly effective at showing growth or progress. Uh, students don't like the traditional grading scales. Um, as soon as I tell them the grading uh, scale that I'm going to be using, the, the XP grading, uh, most of them ask me why other teachers don't use it. Um, my students will start off at a, a zero and their grade will always go up. And I try to explain to them that uh, on the first day of school, if they take a quiz, um, and they get a 100% on that quiz, it doesn't show that they have uh, given me 100% of the knowledge and the skills that they need to demonstrate. It just shows that they got a 100 on that quiz. Uh, and then uh, when they go and take the second quiz and they get an 80, uh, it drops that down. It, it, it's uh, a mathematical function. Uh, the other thing is that a lot of times with a category weight, students get confused. In my system, all of my XP equal the same amount. Um, the, the last thing that I find students like a lot is that uh, they're not punished for getting a good grade. 
Uh, if we take that same situation where a student has a 100 on a quiz for their quiz grade and they get a 95 on a test, that's, an, that's a really good score on the test, and yet their grade goes down simply because of the way that the category weights are taken. Uh, if we use XP grading, they start at zero and they're always working their way up. Um, that means that they're always showing that they've at least progressed some. They, they may have only gotten 50% of the material if they're taking a test, uh, but at least they've shown that they, they've learned some. Another reason I like XP grading is that um, it's I tie mine into mastery learning. Um, this is part of my feedback loop system. Uh, mastery learning, uh, at least the way I understand it, uh, mastery learning is the idea that you need to demonstrate a skill at mastery before you can be awarded the points. Uh, I tie this into a, a feedback skill uh, loop with my XP grading uh, partially because I believe that the XP can't be taken away, that uh, when you award somebody experience points, then at that point you can't take them away. So when in tying this into mastery learning, um, my students will accept a mission. They, it could be a content-based mission, it could be a skills-based mission. Usually I have a main mission for every unit. Uh, they will accept that mission, and they will then uh, work on the skills or the content that they need in order to uh, show me that they've demonstrated the mastery of it. They submit it on a continuous basis. Uh, there's never one day where I say on Tuesday, turn this in. Uh, if they submit it on a, if they accept the mission on a Monday, uh, they might work on it and show me what they've completed halfway through the class. When they do that, uh, we sit and we conference and then we discuss what is good and what needs to be improved. Once we've conferenced, then they go back to work and fix it. Uh, that's the part of the feedback loop. And they keep doing this until uh, they have achieved uh, success. One of the uh, the feedback loop uh, visuals that I found, uh, and I'm borrowing this from uh, Creative Commons site, uh, it's it plan, do, check, act. Um, I like to think of this as... Uh, create, conference, uh, and then repair. So you plan, you uh, accept the mission, you work on the mission, we check, and then you go back and act until uh, you've solved the problem or you have uh, created the, uh, the uh, demonstrated the, the skill or mastery that I am expecting. I did skip over this slide. Uh, this is part of my narrative. This is how I opened up the uh, classroom this year. Um, we did a breakout EDU to start the class. I intentionally designed it to be only like five, six minutes. Um, every, all the classes challenged, but uh, we asked if they were worthy to join the underground. So the first thing that my students did was had to open up this box before they got their syllabus. Uh, and then we got right to work and they this was their first mission. Uh, and this is all them, you know, they're all working on it. Uh, very engaged the first, uh, the very first thing. So, I wanted to mention a little bit about how I build my experience point system. I'll come back to this hearts thing in a second, uh, because this is where I see some questions on how to do an XP system. Uh, it's true that it's difficult. Uh, this is my fourth year working with the XP grading system. Uh, over the last year or two, I, I feel like I've kind of figured out what I'm doing with it. Um, and I do feel that at the high school level, we uh, I need to have a, a, a solid grading system because there is so much uh, at stake in South Carolina anyways, uh, with scholarships and such. So before the semester starts, I lay out my basic activities that I'll expect for each unit. And this is a just a, a very simple spreadsheet. My district mandated a couple of years ago that we have five, uh, three categories, uh, a major assessments, a mid-level assessments, and a practice assessments category. Uh, because this is a high school class, I have to follow the district mandates. Uh, so the major assessments has to count for 50%. So I have uh, what I call the common assessments. Everybody in the district is required to use these. There are three for the first semester. I also throw in uh, a National History Day project. It's a competitive project um, for social studies. Uh, it's a fantastic um, gamified project before I knew what gamifi gamification was. And then I have my mid-level assessments. So for unit one, I have common assessment one worth a thousand points. Uh, I know that they're going to have to watch my flipped recordings, which I call collections. So it's collection uh, one, and there's 500 XP there if they complete all five of the episodes. Um, and then there's going to be a main mission worth 150. And then in the practice, uh, I have 
uh, we'll have three different USA test prep assignments broken up uh, for practice, uh, and those are worth two or 100 or so XP each. So I start with the categories, and then I can fill in the rest later. So I don't have to know exactly what the main missions are going to be. And I leave that open as well because uh, I try to leave a lot of uh, ex um, choice in the XP. Uh, so if um, I might have three different options for that main mission, uh, but they're all worth 150 points. And um, you can adjust that a little bit. Yes. Um, we have two questions about XP. Um, oh, awesome. If you're open to those, Madeline asks, how does the discipline work in the Game Inspire classroom if they don't lose XP? Oh, that's an excellent question. Um, I have not had to fill out a discipline referral in about two years because of this. Um, I don't, uh, I, I typically try not to use grades as a punishment. Uh, we have other motivators. Um, I have a, a ranking system that I really like. Uh, part of that is uh, behavioral. Um, you know, they have to uh, to accomplish certain missions in order to do that. Um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit later about uh, player types. So a lot of it is trying to motivate each type of, of student that comes in. And they're always so busy and they have so many choices that they typically don't have to, uh, they, they typically don't um, complain about the assignments they're doing. Um, and some of that is just, being able to have a blended learning environment where uh, students are off sort of working on their own little bits and pieces and I can focus on the students that are most in need of attention. And uh, then Garrett asks, why not remove the XP as a risk reward system? In every good game, loss is almost a standard. I'm not sure, uh, could you repeat that again? So he said, why not remove XP as a risk reward system? In, in every good game, loss is almost a standard. Um, so making loss acceptable? I, I'm, I, I'm trying to understand the question. Well, he posted in chat, I'm dubious of the idea of not removing XP or allowing the risk reward in line with good game design with positive and negative feedback systems. Uh, removing the grades? I, I think that's where that question is going. I, I could be wrong with that. I'm wondering, um, maybe, if, yeah, could do you have any negative a bit more? All right, um, Garrett, if you want to add anything else, go ahead and type it in chat. And but, yeah, otherwise, um, go ahead, Adam. Uh, I, uh, I'm sorry, Garrett. I, I'm not quite sure uh, what you're. Oh, why? Why don't I uh, risk losing XP? Um, Partially, that's just because I, I like the idea of always showing growth and progress um, through this. Um, once they've demonstrated, they they know how to, um, for example, today we were working on uh, differentiating primary and secondary sources. Once they've shown me that they can uh, tell the difference between a primary and secondary source, I don't like to take away points uh, for something that they've shown that they can do. Uh, that kind of ties into the mastery thing. Um, some people have tied that into uh, badging systems. Uh, so that you can have a badge showing that you've uh, accomplished that skill, and, and that probably would work. Um, it is possible to lose other things in the class, um, although I, I haven't really uh, looked into that part of it yet. I think that might be where uh, he was going with that question. Oh, yeah, yeah. There, then, there's always some risk. Um, and then Matthew asked, do you need to change the amount of XP per assignment each year, maybe depending on the incoming class scores or the previous year's performance? Uh, I have adjusted my my XP values uh, depending on what I uh, want to value that year, uh, what I think the students are going to need for the upcoming classes. Uh, it is possible. Uh, that's one of the factors that goes into it. Um, for example, on the, the chart that we're seeing here, um, the collection missions are the flip classroom part of my class. Uh, I used to put that in the practice assessments, uh, but I found that uh, they needed to have more of that contact, uh, the, the, more of the content information uh, as a background in order to do the main missions. So I needed to adjust that uh, and place a little bit more value on, the, on those particular assignments. So yeah, it is, it is possible to, to adjust those, um, which actually is something I wanted to mention a little bit further down. Uh, I make 10,000 points my goal, 
Uh, 10,000 XP is the goal for uh, the max score. Uh, students can go over the max score. Uh, they can score under 10,000 XP in order to achieve a good grade, uh, but it, it's sort of an arbitrary number. So I just kind of, I try to remember that, that um, having those weighted categories as um, a framework uh, allows me to place my values uh, where I think that they should be. Um, there is one other way that the grades can go down because the district mandates a 20% final exam. Um, this level grade only counts towards um, uh, 80% and then the final exam is another 20%. I couldn't figure out a mathematical way to do that. Um, the one thing that I would suggest though is if you're going to use XP grading, you really do need to um, have a predetermined goal uh, as to where you want the students to go. And then that really should be published as well so that the students can have a, a way to plan their strategy uh, because there are different ways to strategize in the game. Uh, at least in, in the game that I've developed, uh, students can uh, accomplish a little bit more of one type of an activity. They uh, are able to select avatar types. So uh, depending on the avatar, they can earn extra uh, value, extra gold, extra XP based on the, the, the type of assignments and the way that they want to play the game. Um, let me just, wow, you're right, time does go quick in these. It goes, it goes very <laughs> fast. We have one, another question from Michael. He said, how do students and players see one another's XP and achievements? Um, they don't see XP since that's tied to grades. Um, what they do have is a, uh, I've developed a, a bit of a ranking system, uh, actually based on my uh, son's karate <laughs> belts. Uh, let's see, I think I have a picture of it here. Yep, uh, this is my tie rack. Along the left-hand side is uh, the white tie ranks. Uh, this is sort of a mock leaderboard. Uh, so students start off as a white tie. Uh, once they hit level seven, uh, I have 40 levels. So today we had our first belt tests actually. Once they hit level seven, they can uh, test to move up into the white bow tie. I like bow ties. I seem to like them better than straight ties. Uh, so they can test up and uh, they take a, a short multiple choice question test. Plus they perform a, a skills based test. Uh, today it was separated primary and secondary sources. So uh, this avoids tying it into the grades and it's a voluntary action. Uh, that's one of the, the, the positives of this. Uh, they get rewards for moving up in rank. Uh, I have something called the Black Tie Lounge uh, in my class, so they can uh, get sit in comfy chairs that I bought at Goodwill, but they're comfortable. And um, so we had six students that were eligible and five decided to test up. And uh, now we have five white bow ties. Uh, so as they go up through the system, uh, the, the goal is to get up into the Black Tie range so that uh, they can become of our part of our uh, Black Tie Hall of Fame and get their picture on the wall. Um, there are other achievements. I give out stickers sometimes if uh, there's an important badge. Um, but a lot of the rewards come from uh, the different player types and avatar type and uh, motivations that I've looked into. Uh, and let me just go through that quickly because uh, that's something I'm excited to share. Um, per, uh, first of all, this is a, the personalized HUD that the students have. Every student gets this. Uh, on the handouts, there is a, uh, a link to my uh, gamified grade book. Uh, it's modified from an old Alice Keeler beta tested book uh, she let me borrow. Uh, I figured out how to link that up to uh, another spreadsheet that uh, has each student's individual accomplishments. Uh, this is a, an example. Um, so this is their level uh, where it says level six. Uh, they have all their grades down the left hand side. Uh, they lose hearts if they turn something in late. Uh, Garrett, that's one of the risk factors. Uh, if they lose heart, they lose uh, their special skills for the tests and uh, XP advantages, uh, their power bonuses. Um, and students can earn different powers based on their different avatar types. I have six different avatar types. Uh, these are three, uh, the executive, the rogues, and the artisans. I try to model them on different player types. I also try to model them on the, the different types of uh, skills that I see students have in the classroom. So executives are my leader type. Uh, and they can um, distribute gold to students once uh, their teammate has, uh, any of their teammates have um, uh, accomplished a mission with them. They can hand out little rewards as a, a motivation. Uh, the rogues are the students that uh, like to be alone. They also tend to be the killer types. Uh, if you're into uh, Bartles, uh, they're uh, the disruptor types. If you 
prefer what I'm going to show you next. Uh, but the rogues can challenge other students to a, a little uh, battle, uh, and the winner takes, uh, takes a wager. Uh, artisans are the ones that like to draw. Uh, they can perform a, a special extra task to, uh, to, to hang up on the wall. So there's, there's three other types, and they're all modeled on uh, the, the Andrew Marcus, uh, Marc Markuski's uh, player type hexad, which I kind of like a little bit more than Bartles because I think it uh, applies better to the classroom. Uh, there's the free spirits that want autonomy and choice. Uh, achievers, which are really excited about mastery. Uh, there's the player player type, uh, and these students are out for the reward. And, and this is where I think most school is uh, built, uh, is to reward things like grades. Uh, and the students that do the best tend to be the ones that are interested in collecting the rewards. Uh, things like grades and honor roll sheets and such. Uh, socializers, they want to be able to work with others. They want to have that social fun. Uh, philanthropists, which want to have a sense of purpose in what they do. They want serious fun. Uh, and then disruptors who just want to uh, see things change. Uh, they're both good and bad disruptors. Good disruptors want to help fix the games, uh, fix the problems in the classroom uh, so they can be your best friend. And then there's the black hat disruptors that just want to break things to break things. Uh, that's where what my school would, uh, what we have in my school, we call them uh, intentional non-learners. That's where they fit. And we need to figure out how to get them from um, being those black hats to the, the more white hat disruptors, how to make them allies. Uh, let's see. Uh, a lot of this is uh, similar to what you'd see in a uh, an online role-playing game. So that, that's where a lot of this model comes from. Uh, and, and one last thing on player types is I'd like to remember that uh, all of our player types are fluid. So you'll see Bartle types out, uh, uh, Bartle type tests, and those are useful for understanding sort of your main motivations. But I think there's been a lot of research, uh, Nikki, um, uh, Andrew Markuski, uh, and, and a few others that are showing that we, we kind of slide from motivations. Uh, so one day I might be interested in, in rewards, but uh, if it's a different assignment or a different mood, I might uh, be more interested in having my own choices for that day. So uh, that's something that I always think about, too, is trying to plan for all the different player types in a given unit or a, a given structure so that um, even if somebody that I know is usually a socializer comes in and they're having a bad day and they just want to you know, go explore something, they have that opportunity as well. Um, and, and I think that's largely the, the big points I wanted to hit. Uh, here are some of my power cards. I try to mower, uh, model the, the power cards and the player types together. Uh, so the champion card, uh, you can have a, a, a boss battle, uh, the free will card, you can have some autonomy during class. Uh, these are tied into the rewards. Uh, so instead of making that grade the reward, I, I try to give other opportunities for rewards and growth and um, motivations. And oh, I, I guess that's it. Um, I would love to take some questions. And, we have uh, a lot of questions. So Madeline asks, how does earning XP outside of the classroom work for students who do not have access to internet or a computer? Uh, that's a, a great question. Uh, my school is actually one-to-one. -one, uh, so all the students have laptops that they're able to take home. Um, but still equity access is, um, access equity is still a major concern of mine. Uh, it's something that I work really hard on with the students individually to try to understand what their needs are. Um, I have, uh, most of my flip classroom materials are on YouTube, but um, I also record all of them and keep them on a USB drive so that students can just put them right out of the hard drive that I know they're gonna be able to take home. Um, if that isn't a solution, I try to have one-on-one -on -one meetings uh, outside of class time with the students so that you know they're not discussing it in front of their classmates. Um, over the last two years since I've been working hard on that, um, I haven't really had all that many issues. I'm, I'm sure there's probably some that I'm overlooking, but um, that is a concern. We also have a little bit of time uh, during the week at my school so the students can have a, a, a bit of a choice on some activities. Um, outside of that, a lot of the XP activities that I do build, uh, they can print off uh, the resources that they need and, and they wouldn't need technology access at home. Okay, great. Uh, Lauren would like to know, do you offer anything other than XP, such as badges or awards for students? If so, how does that play into their grade? Mm -hmm. uh, 
Uh, well, the grade is is only the experience points. I do have an alternative economy that I've built um, where I give out gold. Um, for example, with quizzes, I, I don't like using quizzes for a grade. Uh, so instead of that, what I've started doing is giving the students uh, this gold reward. So if they get a 90 on the quiz, they get 90 gold pieces. If they get a 40, they get 40 gold pieces. Um, and they use that to purchase uh, power cards, uh, which usually have uh, some different rewards. Uh, it can be creature comforts, like they can buy a hat day. Um, they can buy cards that will help them on uh, their test, uh, which is always looming over in the distance. Um, I do give out badges occasionally. Um, my experience with badges is students are always very excited the first badge or two. Uh, and then it, they, once they figure out the pattern, and it, it becomes less of a motivation. Um, I loved your power cards, by the way. Do you mind sharing how you made those or where you got those made? Um, yeah, there is a few people through the uh, XLAP, uh, hashtag XPLAP, uh, that were talking a few weeks ago, a uh, couple of months ago now, uh, about cards. And there's a Magic the Gathering website uh, where you can build your own custom cards. Uh, oh, nice. It is, let me see if I can find the... URL. It is. Yeah, somebody has the URL and can share it. Uh, MTGcardsmith.com. So Magic the Gathering, MTGcardsmith.com. And uh, everything is really pre made there. Um, they block it at my school, but I'm able to, to build them at home. Uh, and then I just save the picture as a JPEG and I can print off. Uh, essentially, if you put nine, a box, a three by three box, uh, you can print about nine off at a time. Uh, and they look really nice. I had a teacher the other day ask where I got them printed, <laughs> and I told them on at school. So <laughs> they look, yeah, they actually look great. Um, Matthew asks, is the XP limited to each subject? In other words, are students allowed to earn all ten thousand XP early in the semester, or is the XP limited? I see each mission mm -hmm. is separate, but are the missions doable at any time during the year? Uh, I limit them. I limit them by unit. Uh, so they only have access to standard one during the, the time frame of standard one. Uh, once I open up the, the second standard, um, then they can they can still go back and, and do standard one. Uh, I like to think of it as like when I played Super Mario Brothers, I had access to world one, but I had to beat that world. And then I can move into to world two, but I can always go back and play the old right. one. Um, so a lot of students will get towards the middle of the semester and realize that they need some more uh, experience points uh, so they'll go back and work on a skill that they may have bypassed in order to uh, to move on. Okay, Michael asks, do you have data to support that gameplay engages more slash all students more than standard best classroom practices? Um, I have it somewhere. Um, <laughs> I have lots uh, of data. It's about three or four years old now. Uh, I'm not sure exactly where it's at. Um, and I'm sure some of the people that are uh, uh, in the comments uh, would have that uh, more at hand. Um, I have dug into it a bit and uh, there is a lot of support for engagement. Um, just personal anecdotal data. Uh, I've noticed that my test scores have gone up uh, since I started using it. Um, I like to think of it as a best practice. If you really look at uh, yes. the and the way the games are used, uh, it does tie into things like um, uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Uh, it ties into, uh, man, I'm, I'm blanking on all the names, uh, but it does tie into, um, uh, we, we use uh, the engagement cube. So uh, it's high level strategies uh, combined with the, um, I, I'm really sorry, I, I'm not pulling this off the top of my head, but, um, but I, I think you made your point. There is a huge research base out there and that gains-based learning is a best practice um, if you want to frame it that way. I, I like to think that the game play is a framework uh, and that within the framework, we can still do some of the activities that uh, I know are best practices, uh, working with the different documents and, and that. And so that may be a partial answer to this next question, which is from Lynn. She said she's been one of five humanities teachers in her school, but her senior told her off for doing her own thing instead of doing the printed worksheets. 
she mm -hmm. provided. I cover the same knowledge and skills. Is it hard to get all admin and seniors on board like mine? Um, I am lucky that I have a very supportive administrator. Uh, my principal is behind me. Um, I'm also the one of the few teachers in my department. We have a department of three and we're all supportive of it. Um, I've had, I've been doing, this is my fourth year experiencing game, the game inspired classroom. I've had one student that didn't really care for the way I did my grading. Uh, and after the first few weeks, he was on board because he was seeing the gains that he was making. Um, I know that sounds very pie in the sky, but uh, it, it really has, I haven't had any issues with it. Um, I, part of that is that I do like to offer a lot of choices. Uh, I don't really do a lot of worksheets. Um, a lot of it is creating materials. It, um, it is allowing the students to make their own meaningful choices uh, instead of uh, uh, the analogy I use is I, I offer my students vegetables and they can either have peas or carrots. Uh, it, it's not like that. It, it's offering them the ability to uh, create a product. If they're artistic, they can they can create something that's artistic. If they want to write a paper, they can write a paper. So uh, there's a lot of choice as long as they're hitting the same skill sets. We have two questions left and then we're going to wrap it up. Um, Andrew asked, have you explored reacting to the past at all? Uh, I was actually looking into that a little bit uh, a couple of days ago. My uh, I work uh, at the uh, local university and there was an email about that. I, I didn't dig too much into it, but I've, I've heard a bit about that. Uh, I'd like to hear more actually, yeah. I haven't heard about it, so I'd be interested to learn too. Lauren asked, what do your students think about how you run your classroom? How do you get their feedback? Uh, a lot of it's anecdotal feedback. Um, like I said, I haven't had to write anybody up in a couple of years. Um, we spend a lot of time building relationships the first part of the, of the semester. Um, I do what we call it a two plus two model uh, of feedback every few months or so. So after the first test, I usually ask them to uh, write down two things that they uh, like about the class so far, two suggestions about what to improve. Um, I've used and I try to use the suggestions in order to improve the class. Um, one thing that uh, we fixed from last year, I used to use uh, Edpuzzle, which uh, forced the students to watch their videos one way and they all complained because they weren't using YouTube. Uh, so one of the students taught me how to make a YouTube playlist and now they seem to really like that. So uh, trying to offer them opportunities to get feedback really helps. Great. Michael asked, how much experience with RPGs might a teacher need to begin to try to be a game master teacher? Is this approach good for almost or most teachers? Uh, that's an excellent question. Uh, I have a lot of role playing experience myself. So um, I think that uh, some of the. Uh, I was listening to a podcast yesterday. Um, and every game is a little bit different. Um, what works for me with a role playing game might not work for some other teachers. Um, on my slow chat, um, XPLAP camp, um, we do try to explore some of the other uh, game styles and how you can apply some of those mechanics. Um, if you're not comfortable with a particular mechanic, you know, you can always add a different uh, piece. Um, I jumped in with both feet doing this and, and it's, it's, changed over the last few years. Uh, but I started with points, badges, and leaderboards. And I, I realized that the badges weren't being as effective as I was hoping. And then the leaderboards were um, slowly whittling away. So I, I dug into deeper uh, motivators. Um, mm. There's a, a ramp motivators, relatedness, autonomy, mastery, purpose, uh, different types of SAPS rewards. Uh, status access power and stuff and, and how those rewards could be applied to a classroom. So it doesn't necessarily have to look like a role playing game, uh, but using some of those mechanics are, are going to be helpful as well. And our last question and maybe one of the most important ones from Benjamin <laughs> says, how does building and running the gamification system impact your workload? Uh, this is going to be a two part answer. The, the first part is at first it was a lot of work developing the narrative, uh, building the world, um, figuring out the XP stuff. Uh, so that was um, difficult. Actual class time is so much easier. Uh, having 
students choose their own materials, submit on a continuing rotating basis, uh, and then having them sort of in this constant mode of um, iteration, that has lightened the workload so much. Um, I don't take home a whole stack of papers anymore. Um, it's a, a constant process of feedback and construction, and that part is so much easier. Um, not having to look at a, a stack of 90 papers that I right. need to do over the weekend. Right. Okay. Um, Adam, if people are interested in touching base with you after this webinar, are you open to sharing your email in the chat? Uh, absolutely. Um, do you want me to just say it or would you like me to put it in? Uh, uh, type it in or say it and or and we'll type it either way. Um, it's uh, A Powley, A P O W. L E Y. Let's see if I can put it in. Zero zero one at uh, let me give you the Yahoo, Yahoo.com. Great. And then you um, gave us a handout, which um, in case people haven't seen it, that's on a handout tab. Do you want to share what that is? Uh, those are some useful links to. Um, my gamified grade book, uh, how it links up to the personalized grade sheets. Uh, there's some functions that I'm sure are clumsy and other people would know how to do better, but it works for me. Uh, so if you're interested in taking a look at those, uh, those are there. I also link to one of my flipped YouTube playlists. Uh, if anyone's interested to see what that looks like. Uh, and um, there's a, a picture of a poster, because I couldn't find the actual form uh, of a, a my, a method that I use that I call quicker. Uh, it's a way to help the students get through the quick lessons faster. Um, oh, nice. So I'd be more than happy to talk about that as well. Um, I've been blogging about all this for about a year, so you can check out my blog too. It's uh, gameinspireddesign.wordpress.com. I'm typing it in right now. Oh, fantastic. Uh, so I've been, uh, a lot of this stuff that I talked about, I, I, I try to keep it as a almost a stream of thought reflection on my classroom. Uh, it's less about advice and more about what I'm doing and what's working and, and things that I'm trying to fix. So um, it's been a really helpful tool for me to, to both improve my practice, but uh, hopefully inspire some others to improve theirs too. Thank you so much for um, sharing today, Adam. It was really cool to see what's going on in your classroom and um, hear about some of your strategies and tips. I'm going to stop the recording, but it will be available um, on this archive on Big Marker, and we'll also be uploading it to our YouTube channel. Um, if anybody wants to get in touch with Adam, you've got his contact information. If you want to get in touch with me, um, there's my contact information. And we look forward to seeing some of you, hopefully, at our next webinar. Um, so have a great day, everybody. And thank you again, Adam. Really appreciate you. If anybody wants to reach out at Twitter, too, uh, I'm just at Mr. Powley, so I'd love to chat more. Great. Have a great day, everybody. Thanks for coming. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. -bye. Bye.